for Stories Untold. I'm Pule Mulebati. Thank you for being here. We truly pride ourselves with the ability to share your stories from your own point of view. It is your show about ordinary Africans with extraordinary stories. Today we bring you the story of Dimakazo Mukwena. He is a queer father raising a quadriplegic daughter. He's more than that though. He's also a philanthropist as well as an academic. Our producer Tsokofazo Mukwena sat down with the men just so we can get a little bit reacquainted with who he is and what he does. His is a story often not told. As stories untold, we were interested to find out why. I grew up in Mpopo in a rural village and uh, growing up um, in a rural village only now in retrospect do I realize that we didn't have a lot of resources and it is only now that I'm waking that I realize that I actually grew up in poverty. It, you know, um, we didn't grow up in abject poverty, but you know, there were days when we would not have enough meals. And I was brought up by my mom. Uh, my mom and my father, they separated when I was three years old. So, and they never divorced. So um, later on, when I think I was in Sabi, like in 1991, um, the only thing that I remember that my father did for me was when he came into my class in 1991 to come and pay for my school fees. When I later became a father, you know, I saw on his grave that I don't want to be the kind of father that he was um, because he did not care for us, you know. And for me, um, that propelled me to want to be a better father than he was. And so to speak, you know, to put him to shame, as it were. I grew up a very shy child and I was bullied a lot in primary school, firstly because I was big, you know, I was bullied and also because, you know, like I was slightly feminine, I got bullied for that. So I only took comfort in my studies. I said, you know, in my heart that even if you guys can bully me, at least um, the one thing that I know I excel at and do so well in, it's my studies. When I get home or when I would get home after school, I would want to do my homework, prepare for my tests, and make sure that my academics were quite proper. And um, after school, you know, other guys, they would go play soccer. And I didn't, I felt that I didn't belong in that space. I would walk to school barefoot, and now it was winter, it was flipping cold. And my mom bought me um, a pair of takeys to wear to school. And the reason why she bought me a pair of takeys is because she wanted me to be able to wear those when going to school. If she was taking me to town, I would need to still be able to wear those pair of shoes. So um, those, were the, um, those were some of the challenges that I faced growing up. But my mom, you know, like she really tried her absolute best to ensure that um, she provided for us, put food on the table, and she was raising a total of nine children. The very earliest memory that I have of like realizing that I'm different. I think the year must have been 1994. Like um, there were these two guys at school, like they were like contrast, you know, like the other one was like a dark handsome guy and the other one was a yellow boy. I just won't say their names. And I was like, oh my God, these guys, you know? So like, I would just have this thing that, you know, I wish I could just touch them and kiss them. Yeah, so. That's my very earliest childhood memory of me realizing that I could be different. But I really didn't know what it meant, you know. Um, I thought maybe, like, um, it's just a phase that I was going through. It would pass. And the year, yeah, so I think I was eight or nine years old back then, you know. I was going to church, you know, to a Baptist church where, you know, like, we're being taught that um, being gay is sinful. And even also later on when I grew up and I started to become part of the youth, you know, like, People at church, they can pick up that, mm, that child is gay and they start to preach a homophobic sermon. Then you start to hate yourself. Oh my God, it means God doesn't love you. And that homophobic sermon for me um, caused me to go into fasting prayers, praying to God, oh God, please, I think I'm gay. Please just take this homosexuality thing away. I want to be accepted in the church. I want to be like any other person. Because people, they wouldn't come out and say, if you are gay, we don't want you in this church. You know, they would quote Bible scriptures and it's there in the Bible. You know, like the Bible is some homophobic scriptures, you know. So like, um, and 
for me personally, I really just think that, you know, they are there to advance a certain kind of an agenda, you know, because we live in a homophobic society. So it just feathers that kind of an agenda. But like for me, what that did for me is that it caused self-hate to say, I cannot be accepted in this way. I need to be like part of everybody else. What other people are doing, I need to do that, you know. Um, most of the time I would, you know, after I come back from school, I would do my homeworks and I'll finish very quickly and then I'll be left with nothing to do. So I really did grow up a lonely child because with the heterosexual people, I felt that I didn't belong in that space, you know. And also playing with the girls, sometimes I felt that, you know, like it's too much, um, you know, I would feel I belonged in that space, but then sometimes I wanted to be with the people who were like me, but I didn't know where to find them. So I just kind of like, um, instead of um, being on the streets, playing, um, playing with other children, I would do chores around the house, like, you know, sweep, a mob and a whole load of other things and clean the yard, etc. In 2013, Dimaka Zomokwena, a communications manager, welcomed his first child, Moni, named after his maternal grandmother. She is now 12 years old. My daughter, you know, she's a different child, so she's going to a special needs school now. So she realizes that she's not the only one. There are many other children in that school that are in a wheelchair and they've got the similar um, hydrocephalus condition as her. And although hers is a worst case and she does see that um, she's actually not the only one. I think the more you see people who are like you, who speak like you or who use a wheelchair like you do in my daughter's case, you get to realize that, okay, um, people like me do exist out there. I'm not an exception to the norm. There are people who are like me. And um, I think that speaks to an issue of identity. And identity and belonging, you know, they can't be separated. For me, the issue of identity, you have to feel that your identity is valid and it needs to be acknowledged. In my daughter's case, so like, I just want to, I think in my own small way, because, you know, like, we all know, everybody knows um, in South Africa, We've got um, a huge percentage of absent fathers. I think Statistics South Africa, I think the news, it was even on the um, Sowetan front page that uh, uh, I think they said over 70% of fathers were absent fathers in South Africa. At home affairs, those children, they were registered like their father's details, they were not there. And it was quite shocking, you know, really shocking. And for me, I just thought to myself that um, if I can share, um, honestly about um, my fatherhood challenges and me being a present father in my daughter's life if i can share that and if that can at least inspire at least one father to want to play a meaningful role in their child's life then i would have achieved my purpose you know In this particular segment, we follow Dimakazo as we go all the way to Limpopo, Wahamake, as he makes a donation of over 300 school shoes. Why? Because growing up in a poverty-stricken home, Dimakazo is much, much more conscious and sensitive to those who are less fortunate than he is. Some 35 kilometers outside Zanin in Limpopo lies the mountainous rural area of Ohaha Ramake. Besides the occasional private vehicles passing by, the area suggests little to no other activities besides farming. These are the streets that Dimaka Tsomokwena was brought up on. As his mother was often away from home due to work, his sister Anna Mokwena took on the role of a mother and a father to young Mokwena. Each and every Sunday, and then the so, get that why you are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good person. You are not going to be a good
ke o ya momme a berekang ne o namela dabolo na go nwe no ruga o tsoga wa kira le snechel ta borotho na go nwe ge le bo ya skolong di jo di a shota mola le mola so na bya no nka se si a bona ke tshwantse gore ke dire plan ya gore ke namele ke momme a ne a bereka wona ne a bereka old age ene me ka go tipona gore yena ne ile a single parent ne a bereka 7 days in a bereka 7 days off ge a thoma TUT o ke ne ka NFSAS and then ke go pula nwa go mo ke libetse gore ne ile nwa go mo feng so ba ile ba mo ba mo founda chele ta ke tsore ne ile ya eng ya no ka re di makatjo ne ile nwa ne ile gore ne a le a le beletse gore a le beletse botlhoki bya kwa gae o ile a tsamaya ga ya fitla tetekela mpete a tetekela a reka room divider dan room ya kwa gae ne ile kgolo ene sne room divider ne ile sofa ar mama skolo ngba mphile chele ta ke tsore ne ile bokae a reka mpete wa gagwe wa go robala a reka room divider ka chele te ba mo fileng yona ke tsore ne ile ya bazaar na and then and nfsa se ya jwela pele ka go mo patella so until yena ga tlo ke re a mereko ya stele mbotsi yena ne a te patella ke ne le gore he ke tshaisha mo ke rekeng and then ke mo di makatjo a dulang gona and then ke thusha ne le anti re tlhapisha ngwana o mo tshentsha di a paro and then re dule le yena gore re mo tshware bya le ka ngwana wa rena re mo tshware equal go tshwana le bana ba ile gore ba felletse course ngwana la anya gore o mo file le shenyi what kind of relationship do we have nana <laughs> eh so like um, i think we have a very good relationship um she moved in with me last year uh, in february when schools reopened just after um, the lockdown so um she came here in pretoria she was staying in hesavu with her mother and um she came to stay with me to start going to a special school here in pretoria um pretoria school for children of cerebral palsy so um and i've always loved my daughter i think um back in 20 i think january 2011 that's when i really came to understand that my daughter is different and this is the kind of condition that she has and initially you know like um i was in denial i thought you know like she would be better you know things would get better she would work she would call and do this and do the all the other things that other children can do and what that did for me mentally is that i went into a depression um and then i went to see a psychologist they gave me medication and at that point in time i realized that you know this will not make the situation go away i needed to work towards accepting my daughter the way that she was and um it took me quite a long time to accept that uh, my daughter will never know the joy of working her mobility is also quite important she needs to go to the shop buy whatever it is that she wants so i think over time we kind of like learned to you know to accept the situation and in terms of like the challenges that she has um you know like i must just say like at the outset that you know i'm very fortunate that you know i'm a middle class father there are people who are in my situation who've got children like my daughters so and for me my thing is if i as a middle class citizen can actually struggle like for instance this thing it costs around about 20000 rand it needs to be replaced and my medical aid they will tell me oh no you must wait for 3 years you can only qualify for a wheelchair every other 3 years even when they pay they would only pay 15000 you must pay an extra 5000 rand from your own pocket and you know like that's all finances you know and if you decide to buy um you know to go through the medical aid and buy before that 3 years period they'll only pay for like 50% then you must carry the other cost and if i can complain about a situation like that how much more so about the poor how much more so about the working class if i as a middle class citizen are experiencing this kind of financial difficulties in providing for a child of my daughter's condition and a little na family as a whole wanola wa di makatjo re a morata e bile re a mo thavela never mind gore o disabled le yena wa tseba gore ga fitile ga e family ya zanen gore re mo tshwara ka ona mogo a tshwanetse gore a be ka gona i think i've got like about five qualifications now like i've got um, a national diploma in language practice b tech in language practice b tech in journalism honors in theory of literature and master's degree in journalism from university of stellenbosch and i think for me um 
over and above wanting to be a good example to my daughter. I need to be able to have the kind of opportunities that our parents didn't have. We all know the history of apartheid in South Africa, you know, like where black people were living in Skwala and the kind of um, education that was given to black people, it was often inferior quality. So for me, I was like, okay, since I've got all these opportunities, let me grab them with both hands. His former teacher at Marke Primary School, Dipuo Marke, was among the first to see his academic potential. The teacher assumed the role of in loco parentis, who took a three kilometer drive with Marke to Marke Primary School, where it all started for Mokwena. Although he used to walk to school barefoot, that did not derail him from his academic goals. For Mandela Day in, um, in 2015, I collected a pair of 327 school shoes um, that I went back to my primary school. And how I collected the shoes is that you know, I started a social media campaign on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Um, it was called hashtag Mike Primary Tuffies. I grew up going to school barefoot and I know even today in that village, there are still children who go to school barefoot. Some of them, they go to school wearing um, flip-flops. Some of them, they go to school wearing worn-out plastic shoes. So I just thought, you know, the fact that I grew up in this community and I know the challenges in the community that I grew up in and the children at that school, you know, um, if I can try to run a campaign whereby I can do something for them, and South Africans, you know, they really opened their wallets and their hearts with love and they contributed to the campaign. Um, I remember I would even get calls from people that I didn't know saying, how can I send you money so that because I'm in like the Northern Cape, I'm in the Western Cape, but I can't reach you in Pretoria, but I would like to contribute. And they would send me money and I felt so guilty that people would send me money to go buy the shoes. And I felt that, um, they would think that I'm taking their money to spend it on myself. So to keep myself accountable, I would um, take their money, go buy the pair of school shoes and come back and post about it on social media and take the person and say, the money that you sent me, this is what I did. I remember there was just this one picture of a worn out plastic shoe that a child was changing from into the new pair of school shoes. I think um, for all that, I felt that I was bothering people and nagging them. For me, that picture convinced me that what I did was a good thing and I should keep on doing it. Being proud and loud, these are the words that Dima Gazzo lives by. The 36-year-old recently self-published his debut novel, Here Comes the Gay King, a novel that symbolizes a powerful moment in Black South African queer people's engagement with pop culture. This, according to renowned author Sia Kumalo. The overarching theme, you know, like is the theme of love that surpasses or that spends the test of time. I also do show that um, as much as that is the case, there are a whole lot of challenges that people in um, homosexual relationships go through, issues of sexual identity and what it means to be a gay man in South Africa today and that being gay, it doesn't negate your, um, the fact that you are an African man. And I also um, dwell on issues of culture and tradition and cultural practices and ancestors take and view on homosexuality and how traditional healers see issues of homosexuality. I actually try to say that um, if you are heterosexual people, you need to understand that um, those who are not like you, they've got the same rights as you have and they've got every right to be here just like you have. And even them, because now the title of my book is Here Comes the Gay King. And I wanted to show that um, an African gay man can be called by his ancestors to lead his village and be a king irrespective of his sexual identity and his ancestors can know of his sexual identity and still believe that he is the right fit for the throne and no other person can do a better job than this one specific gay man. 
This debut novel has gone through many hands, including business partner and editor Matlane Masilanes. At first, when it was still an idea, and then he would bounce ideas around like um, the kind of book that he would like to write. And then I would advise like, people would probably buy this, but they would not buy this in, 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 in books. And um, so he started writing. His very first 10 pages, I remember, he gave it to me. And then now, um, I, 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 I was mainly criti a, a critique in his book, um, like which, which way would help in, 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 in making the book a bestseller, if that's where he's going. And then um, most of the books about queer people, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a memoir most of them. And then my, my biggest contribution in it was um, maybe to advise him to, 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 to make it a fiction. Then he started having all these beautiful ideas and putting them together. But now he had, he had a nice um, storyline. So when he was writing, he was not writing chapter one, next chapter two, next chapter three. No, he, was write, he would write one and then write 10. And then if you, you, you were just reading all those pieces that you were writing, you would not understand. But if you understand his storyline, then you would get, get where he's going with, with, with what he's writing. And then mainly I was, I, was, I, was, I was like getting all those bits and pieces and then telling him, no, this one will not go with the story. This will go with the story and then the language and, 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 and. His friend of close to a decade, Nari Kekana, considers him as one of the most selfless people he knows. Actually, there's quite a lot I like about Dimakato. I think um, one thing that always stood out for me, especially, especially with our friendship, I mean, every friendship has its ups and downs, right? Um, he's just always that person that will always come and apologize. When he, if he realizes that he's wrong, he will come and apologize. And I mean, he, he doesn't even have to do it immediately, but he will come like whenever, but he will apologize when he, when he does realize that he, he actually went wrong with something. So that's just one of the really coolest quality. And I think also he's a people's person. He likes people. He's very easy to get along with. He's reliable. Um, yeah, and I think uh, more than anything, he also gets along with my, with my family, like my sisters. So we're almost like a big group of friends and family. In a country where 70% of black children, according to states SA, are not raised by their biological fathers, many believe Dimakazo is a beacon of hope. Rena, I feel proud. There is a space uh, for a voice like that in society, uh, especially in South Africa, where there's still quite a lot of, um, I don't know, I don't want to call it hatred, but uh, maybe um, not so much comprehension around what um, homosexuality, homosexuality is. And I mean, also just really hate, you know? Maybe um, books like that being available can actually teach certain people a lot of things and I think Dimakato is really just one of the vehicles for that and I'm really proud of him for that. And as we do it every week right here on Stories Untold, we encourage you to do the little bit that you can in your own way. After all, it takes each and every one of us to make a difference. From myself, Pule Molebati, and the rest of the Stories Untold team, let's do this again, same time, same place.